Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for taking some time out of your day. And uh, hopefully we can learn something. Uh, to those of you who are here in the chat now uh, or in the, the, the Zoom meeting, uh, listen, you're more than welcome at any point. And stop me. You can either ask uh, questions uh, via audio or you can uh, just put your question in the chat. And uh, yeah, then we'll try and take it from there. So um, we're going to deal with a particular blood gas today that I, I found online. And, uh, you know, it was a, a patient that was brought into an emergency department, uh, unresponsive, not in cardiac arrest, but just unresponsive. Uh, and the blood gas was done, which is a common uh uh, situation that we often find ourselves in, uh, in emergency departments and uh, sometimes even, uh, you know, at clinics or, or outpatients areas where we may be working. So it's quite an important thing uh, to be able to interpret the blood gas uh, quickly and effectively because you can get a blood gas within a minute or two, depending on where the machine is. I know at our particular hospital, it takes about five minutes by the time we get it to the lab and they give us a printout. Uh, and certain blood, ga blood gas machines will give you a lot more information than others. So, you know, this is just a, a general uh, guide. So um, let me just uh, just hide this for now. So um, what is the purpose of a blood gas? So the purpose of a blood gas is to determine oxygenation, of course. You're looking at whether your patient is receiving enough oxygen to see whether your patient is ventilated properly or the patient is on a ventilator, or even if they require ventilation. And of course, their acid-based status. Now, that's probably one of the more important things, you know, that we need to figure out. And as we're going through the weeks, uh, this is the first one that we're doing on a blood gas. So we, we'll see different types of uh, acidosis and alkalosis and things like that. But today I decided to cover th this particular one is one of the most common ones that you'll see. So hopefully we'll we'll talk about it, you know. So um, and just get this back up here because I may just need to write in a second. Okay, let me just put that there. So uh, pH indicates uh, whether the patient is acidic or alkalotic, all right, or whether the patient is in acidemia or alkalemia, all right? And the normal range for your pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Anything below 7.35 is generally regarded as acidotic. Above 7.45 is regarded as uh, alkalotic. Now, luckily, alkalosis we do see, but not as common as acidosis. Um, <clears throat> and just remember, a pH of, uh, let's say, 6.7, uh, you know, and less uh, is not compatible with life, you know. So it, it's uh, important that you, uh, you know, have a look at that and, uh, you know, make sure that you try and bring your patient as close to uh, homeostasis as uh, as possible. That's the, That's what we're trying to achieve. Okay. So the next thing that we look at is PCO2. So this is your partial pressure of carbon dioxide. But in essence, what it represents is the acid. Carbon dioxide is the acidic uh, component of our uh, of our blood, if I can put it that way. The amount of carbon dioxide reflects the amount of acid that's actually present. So <clears throat> what happens is the more carbon dioxide that you have in your system, the more acidotic you become, all right? So uh, in other words, as, uh, P, as uh, CO2 uh, increases, all right, uh, pH decreases, okay? So they have, a, uh, you know, an antagonistic relationship, if I can put it that way, you know? And uh, as CO2 decreases, then your pH increases, okay? So it's like a balance, you know? Uh, basically, the more acid you add on, the more acidotic you become, or your pH will get lower. And the less acid that you have in your system, whether it be as a result of compensation or as a result of uh, a disease, your, uh, your, your pH will actually increase. And bicarb, which is now manufactured in your, your kidneys, represents your, it represents your base or your alkali component. All right. And it's how your body actually helps you to become either alkalotic or moves you away from acidosis or makes you more alkalotic. And the, the opposite is true now for bicarb and pH. So as, uh, let's just put it here, as HCO3 increases, your pH also increases. And uh, as your bicarb decreases, uh, so too does your pH decrease. All right. So that's an important thing to understand because that's probably the first thing that 
we look at when we are assessing a, a, a blood gas. You know, what's our what's our how much of carbon dioxide is there? How much of bicarb is there? And what's their relationship to the pH? And that tells us a lot. Now, in today's uh, session, we're not going to delve into the you know the nitty gritties of it. We'll get through you know a few more blood gases and then hopefully uh, we we'll learn a lot more. But just for now, just to understand the basics of how it works. Okay, so. Again, your PCO2, depending on, on where you work, uh, for example, in the United States and those who follow the US system, they have a different uh, measurement. Uh, but for those of us working, let's say in the in the Commonwealth, in the British world, uh, we use uh, a kilopascal. So our normal is uh, 4.7 to 6. And our bicarb is 22 to 26. And our partial pressure of oxygen is 11 to 13. And oxygen saturation, 95 to 98. Um, just a point, it's it's good to have 100% O2, um, but 100% O2 presents its own problems. Uh, one of those is that there's a lot of free radical uh, release, uh, you know, ionized oxygen um, molecules that can actually cause damage. Now, we, we would, you would have learned about it in pediatrics. Uh, in pediatrics, they often advise you not to have a, 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 an oxygen saturation of 100 because it causes retinal, retinal damage. Now, as you get older, you're not necessarily going to get retinal damage, but studies have found that there are other areas that do get affected as well. So having this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, oxygen saturation of 100% is nice. It looks nice. You feel like you're winning the battle, but it's not nice to keep the patient at that level. And especially if you're ventilating a patient long term, that's not where you want to be. Okay. So the most important thing to remember is, first of all, we, we and we're going to go through this uh, with our, uh, our um, uh, example as well. The first thing we need to look at is our pH. So is our patient acidotic? Is our patient alkalotic? And then we look at our carbon dioxide and we look at whether it's increased or decreased, and we look at our bicarb, and we look at whether it's increased and decreased. So to give a simple example, if our patient is acidotic, let's just put it here, all right? So if our patient has a pH, let's say, of 7.1, all right, and a CO2, oh, sorry, not COS, <laughs> a CO2 of 8, and let's just put a simple, 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 a bicarb of 23. All right. Now, for those of you who are here, you're welcome to answer. But if you don't, don't stress about it. Uh, I'll give you the answer, but you, you should be able to pick this out. So we have a patient who's acidotic and we have a, a, a carbon dioxide or acid that's increased. So this is a respiratory acidosis that we have and it's uncompensated because our bicarb has remained the same. So our body hasn't yet responded to this respiratory acidosis. Now, Take this the other way around and let's say we put a, a bicarb of 18. If we have a bicarb of 18, then it tells us that our body is starting to respond and is starting to work against the uh, the, the respiratory acidosis. So we now have a, uh, a compensated uh, respiratory acidosis. Now let's take it uh, another way around. Uh, sorry, let me put it here. Let's put five. And let's put a bicarb of 10. So in this case, when we look at it, we see an acidosis, which we have because our pH is a bit low. Our carbon dioxide is within the normal level. So that means the, um, the respiratory component or the acid component is not really the issue. The issue comes from our bicarb. Our bicarb is low. So this tells us it's a metabolic acidosis and it's also uncompensated. Okay. So the way that the body would compensate for this is to remove CO2. So the way that the patient removes CO2, and for those of you who have been working, you would notice that patients often have very, either a very uh, deep, uh, you know, inspiration and expiration, because mouth's breathing, or they may have uh, tachypnea where they try to blow off as much carbon dioxide as possible. So those are the things that you can see on the patient. So there's just some basic examples of how we look at a blood gas, all right? So <clears throat> let's, go in, let's go ahead and have a look at our our patient now. So remember, this patient was brought in and this patient was uh, unresponsive. Okay. So it's a venous blood. Now, the main difference between venous blood and um, uh, arterial blood is that venous blood tends to be slightly more acidotic because the carbon dioxide content in venous blood is slightly higher than normal. 
And uh, you tend to find uh, also that your, your potassiums uh, and your calciums tend to be a bit higher, but your sodium tends to be a bit lower. Uh, so that's generally what you find. That's the main difference. But it's not a huge difference. But ideally, you want to get a proper uh, arterial, arterial blood. But if you don't and you do get a venous blood, you just got to be able to uh, look at that. So let's just look at what we had seen a little while ago. And, and don't worry about these measurements. Like I say, now these are more the US measurements that are being used, but we've, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just look at it as to whether it's high or low. So in this case, we have a patient with a pH of 6.9, which is quite a severe acidosis. Once you start getting below seven, it is quite severe. All right. And if we look at our partial pressure of our PCO2, our carbon dioxide, we actually see it's low. So it's not a respiratory acidosis. And when we go to our bicarb, uh, in this case, the bicarb is extremely low. It's extremely low. Uh, the value is not actually the value, well, here they've got it as three uh, based on their measurement, but this is a metabolic acidosis that the body is trying to compensate for. So you'll find this patient may have shallow, rapid breathing, or very deep exploration in order to get that uh, carbon dioxide out. And the body can actually um, compensate quite quickly from the respiratory side. It takes much longer for it to uh, compensate from the metabolic side, but it, it does happen, okay? Uh, we found here our PO2, it will be slightly decreased because this is a venous blood sample. And another thing we see, the sodium, slightly low. Our potassium here is high. Now, one other point that I just want to make to you guys, I'll just try and put it, uh, let's see, where can I put it? All right, let me try and put it here. So there's a relationship between uh, potassium and pH, right? And, uh, sorry, let me just put it here. My apologies for the, the, the noise in the back, that's just the kids, all right? So uh, what happens is, as your pH uh, decreases, i.e. acidosis, and as you become more acidotic, your K plus, your potassium, is actually higher. Sorry. So your, your potassium is normally higher than what's reflected on the uh, sample. All right. And uh, as your pH increases, uh, that is uh, alkalosis, your K plus your potassium uh, is generally uh, lower. Uh, then indicated. All right. Now, th this is uh, what we call an ad adjusted so a potassium uh, calculation. All right. Now, I don't want you guys to stress too much about this. I'm just I'm just uh, bringing it up to your uh, attention so that you understand. All right. So uh, an adjusted K, uh, uh, potassium calculation. All right. So there are calculators online that you can use where you actually put in your pH and you put in your potassium and it works it out for you. The reason being that I've often found people find it quite difficult to work out the calculation. Uh, and, and I'm going to I'm going to give you the calculation now. And if you don't understand it, don't stress about it. But we'll use it as an example on this. And then uh, you'll see why it's so much easier just to use an online calculator. <laughs> so as your as your pH, uh, let's say, decreases by a factor of one. All right. So in other words, if it goes like, for example, from uh, 7.35 to 7.25 uh, to, let's say, 7.25, your potassium actually in, oh, sorry, I've done it again. Uh, your potassium increases by 1.5. Uh, right. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd calculation uh, because you've got to now work out precisely how many factors down have you gone, and then try and work out exactly how much your potassium has increased. So for those of us who do still do it the old-fashioned way, uh, we just kind of take a, a more or less approach. So, right. so for example, here, the pH is 6.92. Let's say it's 6.95. So we would go from 6.95 to 7.5 uh, to 7.15 to 7.25 to 7.35. So that's a factor of four. So in other words, we would expect our potassium to actually be 6, uh, increase 1.5 times 4, which is equal to 6, 
which means that our actual potassium here would be closer to over 10. Now, it's very rare that it actually goes up to 13 and things like that. But let's just say it's close to 10 because beyond 10 is incompatible with life, all right? But just to give you an example of how the calculation is worked, and the opposite is true. So as your pH increases above 7.35, for every factor of one, your potassium actually decreases by that. So I wouldn't stress too much if you don't remember this. The important thing is to know that it does exist. The reason why I bring this out is because sometimes you have a patient who is extremely acidotic. Let's say has a pH of 6.8 or 6.9, and you find a potassium, let's say, of 5 or 4.2 or something like that, and you think it's okay. But when you calculate it out, you actually find that your patient is hyperkalemic. Now, <clears throat> This also affects calcium, but not to such a great extent. And it affects potassium, uh, sodium, but also not to as great an extent. Potassium is the main one that it affects. All right? And that's for a variety of reasons. It mainly has to do with the effect of acidosis on the cell wall. And there's a whole uh, physiological thing that goes on, which will be a lecture on its own if I had to start with it now. So we're just going to leave it out. So when you are looking at a blood gas and you see the potassium in the face of uh a low pH, just realize that it may be higher. So you may see, for example, signs on the, um, what you might call it, ECGs, and you may be wondering where it's coming from. Your patient may start having arrhythmias. At least you know, okay, I've got to maybe do something about the, this uh, potassium. So I hope you guys understood that. Don't stress about the calculation. It's not important. And like I say, if you go online and you just punch in, uh, you know, potassium calculator, uh, th th there's like 10 that pop up immediately. And it takes like a second, you know, just to punch in your values and it gives it to you as well. All right. Uh, so sodium slightly low. Potassium, as we know, is much higher than what we expect here. There is calcium as well. That's a bit low. And your lactate, which is a little bit elevated as well. So lactate, uh, for those who don't know, maybe, lactate is basically when your cells are not perfused, they start to scream, all right? They want to let you know that they are not getting oxygen. So they basically move from the aerobic Krebs cycle into the anaerobic cycle, all right? Or the I think it's called the pyruvate cycle, if I remember correctly, but I may be wrong. Yeah, I stand to correction on that. Um and the byproduct of that is lactate. All right? Now, please don't ask me to recite the Krebs cycle. I learned it when I was in university, and I've seen it many, many times, but I cannot remember it for the life of me. I just remember that they go into the anaerobic. <laughs> okay. So you get the, um, what you call it, the release of lactate. And once your lactate starts going above two, that's when you know you've got a little bit of a problem. Apologies for that. It's just my little one in the background. Um <laughs> He doesn't like to see his dad, uh, you know, not being with him, unfortunately. And then the hemoglobin, in this case, as you can see, they're using the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, variant. It's uh, 63, which is quite low in any case, all right? So what we have here is a patient with severe acidosis that is being compensated to a certain extent, has hyperkalemia, and has evidence of slightly increased lactate and decreased uh, HB as well. So... All of these things, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think it's got the wrong one. It's supposed to have, be 83 here. My apologies, not 63. Uh, but that is quite low. So what's the first thing that we're going to do for this patient? Now, the thing that we need to do for this patient is that we need to bring this patient back to as close to normal as we can. All right. So the first thing we're going to try and do is treat the pH. Now, there's a few ways to treat the pH. The first way to treat the pH, and being a metabolic acidosis, in this particular case, we can, for example, use sodium bicarbonate, all right? Now, sodium bicarbonate is a very good drug to use, there's no doubt, but it has been linked to, uh, sorry, let me just write this up, sodic, uh, just so that we know. So it is, uh, uh, what you would call it, uh, connected to high mortality, all right? Uh, in other words, patients who have received sodium bicarb, when they, the, the rates of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the rate of survival when leaving hospital is lower than those who didn't receive sodium bicarb, all right? But there is a rule for the use of uh, using it, all right? So the rule of using, it's called the rule of sevens, all right? The rule of sevens. So the rule of sevens will state that either your pH is less than seven, less than seven, or your potassium is greater than a 
sorry, let me just put the, I'm actually making life difficult for everybody. Potassium is greater than seven. Okay, so these are the two times when it is encouraged for you to use sodium bicarbonate. So in this case, we have both con conditions. We have a pH that's below seven and we have a potassium that's above seven. So this is a good time for us to use sodium bicarbonate. All right. So the normal dose is one milli equal, uh, sorry, one milli equal, where's the Q? Uh, one milli equal per kilogram. All right. Now, th that sounds uh, quite easy, uh, but the way that we actually know how many milli equals to give is that you use 8.5% uh, normally, all right? That's normally what's used in uh, most uh, uh, emergency departments. And uh, really, I do apologize for the noise in the background over there. I hope it's not disturbed to <laughs> kids are on holiday now, and I think they've had a bit too much sugar today. So I apologize. For that. So 8.5% so 8 soda big. Basically, you get one milli equal per mil. All right. So that's how soda big works. So, for example, if this patient of ours weighed uh, 50 kilograms, all right, 50 kilograms, then it stands to reason that we would give them 50 mils. Okay. If they were 100 kilograms, we would give them 100 mils. Okay. Now, what happens if you have uh, 4%? Because some places do only have 4% sodabic. Sorry, 4% sodabic is basically it equals 0 0.5 uh, milli equals per mil. So you would just double the amount, all right? So in this case, a 50 kilogram uh, person uh, would receive 100, oh, sorry, sorry about that. Just get this out of there. Um, sorry about that, 50 kilograms uh, would receive 100 ml and so on and so forth, okay. So this is an easy way to remember how to use sodium bicarbonate. And the thing with sodium bicarbonate is don't rush. Many people are under the impression that you need to immediately give the soda big within five to 10 minutes, it needs to go in. Now, your minimum should be at least, uh, sorry, uh, minimum should be at least 20 to 30 minutes, all right? So try and give it in over that amount of time. And after you've given that, that's when you recheck your blood gas. Now, hopefully in that time, your pH would have improved and your, so, uh, your potassium would have gone down. Now, of course, you're not going to just leave your so potassium at, to the hands of soda big. Your, your, your potassium can also be decreased in many other ways. And we have discussed this before in one of our ECG uh, sessions. So, you know, we could start with nebulization. We'd have to give this patient calcium as well. All right. Calcium gluconate. Uh, we could give this patient, for example, Lasix. You know, so there's quite a few things that we can do to actually try and get this patient uh, a bit under control. And of course, insulin. Sorry, uh, that's the one thing that I'm forgetting about, our insulin as well. So all of these things will help to bring our uh, potassium down. Okay, so uh, we'd be treating our potassium and we'd be treating our acidosis as well. Um, <clears throat> are there other things that we can do to try and alleviate the acidosis? Sure. You can, for example, now in, in this case, this patient will most likely need intubation. The patient would also need probably hyperventilation in, immediately to try and bring down your CO2 a little bit more. Although hyperventilation has the side effect of vasoconstriction in the brain. So, you know, that sometimes is uh, uh, frowned upon if you're going to use it for a, an extended period of time. But for a short period of time, it's not really a problem. And of course, you are giving bicarb, so that's going to help as well. We are giving potassium, I mean, uh, calcium to help for our potassium problem. And uh, of course, this patient in this case would need a transfusion as well. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you are going to be given in the meantime. Uh, one of the things is that you're, uh, just to mention about the um, blood transfusion uh, that a lot of people forget about, uh, your uh, blood is actually preserved uh, in uh, calcium citrate, All right? Calcium citrate, oh, sorry, in, in citrate. Okay, sorry. Um, in citrate, okay, uh, in citrate, which drops your calcium as well, unfortunately, all right, which drops your calcium levels. So you need to keep an eye on your calcium levels if you are doing um, uh, transfusion. So uh, I hope you guys understood that. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask me at any time. If you've fallen asleep as well, that's perfectly fine. This is one of the more boring ones. 
given in a little while, but I hope it makes sense as to what's going on. To those of you who are on the chat at the moment, what do you think the possible cause could be if this was your patient sitting in front of you now, presenting with high potassiums, uh, very low bicarb, cannot produce bicarb, uh, you know, is unable to exchange sodium for potassium, uh, you know, is becoming more and more acidotic, you know, uh, but however, is still perfusing relatively okay, and is also losing, uh, you know, the, 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 they, they're slowly losing their, their uh, you know, the HP is going down as well and things like that. I don't know if anybody wants to venture a guess, but if you don't want to venture a guess, that's fine because what we'll do is that we're going to go through it uh, on the next slide, which is the last slide, so don't worry. Uh, and uh, yeah, let, let's go on to that so that we can see. Um, all right, let's have a look at that last slide and then maybe we'll have a better idea what's going on. So a lot of people at this point would sort of like, okay, let's try and, um, you know, sort out the problems and things like that. But you've also got to try and, oh, sorry, second last slide. Okay. Now, everything that's here, what I would suggest is if you have a chance and you are watching this video, maybe pause it at this point and just take a, a snapshot, a screenshot of this, uh, because uh, it's just going to give a, a, you a basic breakdown of everything that we've talked about so far. Okay. Uh, we're not going to uh, go into it very uh, in much more detail. I think about the only thing yeah, that I missed out was probably that we'd want to uh, give a bit of fluids as well and things like that. And, uh, you know, just to consider some of the um, uh, possible causes would be renal failure, tissue breakdown, uh, sepsis, renal dysfunction, things like that. But we'll get to that in a little while. But this is just a the systematic way of looking through uh, a, a blood gas. So, you know, if you want to take a, a screenshot of this, it's a nice thing just to look at, but I'm not going to dwell on it because it's everything that we've uh, talked about so far. So the last thing to talk about, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because this is one of the most common things that you would find on your blood gas. I would say from all your blood gases, 60 to 70% of your blood gases are going to end up as this. And that being a, uh, an elevated NIM gap metabolic acidosis, all right, which is called AGMA for short, okay? And in, if you've been working for quite some time, you'll notice that you do see a lot of these. So let's just go through it. So quite simply, how is the NIM gap worked, worked out? It's sodium. Uh, and then you, uh, you take chloride and you add your bicarbonate value and sodium minus that value of your chloride plus your bicarbonate, okay? Now, this is also something you can find online. Uh, if you can't remember it, you know, just put the ion, anion gap calculator. It just asks you for the three values and it tells you whether it's normal or high, whatever it may be. So the normal range for the anion gap is 8 to 12 millimoles per liter. That's if you don't use potassium. If you do use potassium, then it's uh, 12 to 16. But most of us just use the chloride and bicarb and we take it from there. So in this case, we had an anion gap where the sodium was 135, our chloride was 104, and our bicarb was 3. So 104 plus 3 is 107. 135 minus 107 gives you 28, which is far above the normal range. Okay. Now, please don't mis don't uh, misunderstand me that uh, all of your 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 um, uh, uh, blood gases are going to be this elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's just very common. Uh, I'm saying 50 to 60 percent from what I've seen. In other areas, it may be different depending on the disease profile. So, um, you know, that, that's basically it, all right? So what are the most common uh, causes of it? Uh, and uh, this is, of course, now metabolic acidosis, which we had mentioned. Uh, but, I mean, it could be due to shock, hypoxia, sepsis, diabetes, alcohol, starvation, ketoacidosis, and renal failure, uremia, ingestion of toxins such as methanol, ethylene glycol, glycol and salicylates. Now, all this does is just bring you a bit closer to what it may be. Now, if you had to give me this blood gas and ask me to have a look at it, based on the fact that the glucose was generally within normal, I would suspect that this is probably a patient who was already in a form of renal failure, whether it was advanced, moderate, mild, something. And then there was sepsis overlying that. The reason for that is the HP that's dropping. Uh, <clears throat> the high potassiums, low bicarb, tend to point towards a renal cause. 
because your and and the sodium uh you know also not, uh, being a bit on the low side because your your renal tubules are unable to actually uh you know exchange your sodium for your potassium and then there's a whole uh thing that happens with your uh, your hydrogen molecules as well and they're unable to produce uh, bicarb and what i hope to do one of the days is have a session where we just talk about renal tubular acidosis there's two types but i don't I don't want to bring it up now because I, I know everybody who's on the chat will just switch out and be like, okay, no, this is too much for us to take. So we'll talk about it uh, in, a, in another session. But if it were me and this were my patient, I would be looking towards a renal core. So I'd put a catheter, look at output, wait for a UNE to see the ureas, creatinines, GFRs, things like that. And chances are it would be uh, quite deranged as well. And that would guide us as well as to what's going on. I'd also probably give them antibiotics and transfuse them as well. But I hope this gives you an idea of how... Um, uh, you know, how to start looking at a blood gas. This wasn't a particularly complicated blood gas, and it was a good one to actually start off with and uh, have a look. This is just a bit of a joke to finish off. We wish all our... <laughs> Our blood gases could look like that. Unfortunately, they don't. Uh, so, you know, if there's any questions, now's the time to ask. Um, and if you're happy as well, if you understood the uh, uh, the basics behind what I was saying, I hope that that's okay. And I hope to do a few more blood gases over the coming weeks to show the different types that we get uh, so that uh, people will get a better understanding of uh, the different types of scenarios that you are faced with. Blood gas, exceptional tool for us to use. Uh, if you're lucky enough to work in a hospital where they give you a full blood gas with everything, you're really lucky. I mean, I know in our hospital at the moment, we're just getting uh, very basic uh, things. No, thanks a lot, Doc. I appreciate that you, you, uh, the, the sentiment there. I really do appreciate it, and I hope you're understood as well. Um, yeah, so um, please, you know, go back, uh, look at the video again if there was anything you didn't understand. If there's any questions, even if you don't think of a question now, you can always, uh, you know, uh, send it to me on the WhatsApp or Telegram groups, or you can even comment on the YouTube video, and I'll try and get back to you. But if everybody's okay and... Um, you know, it's uh, everybody's happy with all of that. Then uh, we'll we'll actually uh, stop the meeting there. And uh, I, I just want to thank all of you again. And I hope to to see you guys again for the next one. It should be next week Monday. I haven't decided what we'll do, but it'll probably be an ECG. And I hope to see you guys there. 